I've been doing talks like this, or similar talks, for almost 14 years now, so um, you can imagine how exciting it is. And um, so I'm constantly trying to reinvent the talk and work out what's new. And obviously I realise that many people in different audiences come to this subject with their own set of ideas as to what drives the phenomena that we see. And so I am going to a little bit try and upset some of those assumptions as to whether it's to do with British foreign policy or race relations or religion or you know, other grievances that particular groups may have in the United Kingdom. And I wanted to start tonight by actually just, uh, and Paul has already reminded us, that there is a general election going on. Um, depending on how involved you are, um, you may or may not have noticed. And, um, and I'm just going to give you a little vignette from that general election that's got nothing to do with the subject that we're talking about tonight, and yet I think it has everything to do with the subject that we're talking about tonight. And that is, I saw um, Tristan Hunt, I think he was on Newsnight or BBC News or something, and he was visiting a school, Tristan Hunt is the shadow education minister, and um, he was uh, you know, reminding students there, or pupils as we used to call them, that uh, maybe one day with a Labour government, they may have the vote too. And he asked a, a young child, um, you know, who, who would you vote for if, if we gave you the vote? And the kid goes, you kip. And he goes, oh, really? And uh, he goes, yeah, because I kicked the foreigners out. And this would have been Tristan Hunt's moment, his opportunity to smash that argument, to demolish you know, the idea that foreigners are a problem or that there's more of them than ever before. You know, anything. And what did he do? He said, uh, 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 I see. Uh, well, 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 we'll have to see. And he moved on. And you kind of think, well, you're in the middle of an election. What is it about you that you can't even argue the case you're trying to argue in a public space? And I actually think that's very insightful because part of the problem that we're confronting when we talk about radicalization and security, is very similar. Let me draw the parallel for you. Avinash Tharoor, someone that none of you will probably have heard of, was a fellow student at the University of Westminster at the same time as Mohamed Mwazi, who some of you will know of as Jihadi John. And he wrote a piece in the Washington Post on the 27th of February where he points out that once, he, he wasn't in the same classes as Mohamed Mwazi, but he did a uh, course in international relations, and he was in a lecture on Kant's democratic peace theory. And the lecturer was talking about it, and a young Muslim girl in a full niqab stood up and said, well, I'm a Muslim, so I don't believe in democracy. And, um, and he said that those kind of comments were not that uncommon at the University of Westminster, but what shocked him was the fact that the lecturer made no attempt to engage the girl in a discussion about, well, maybe democracy could be useful for you know, young, disenfranchised women, whatever theory he's got about democracy, but no attempt at all to defend democracy in a class on democracy. And I think there is a connection there, because we're living in an age where people are afraid to say what they really think. And you can say, you know, I live in Bath, very beautiful, you know, 18th century Georgian, you know, set piece. And, you know, like very few, I mean, I've been out of the country for six years, so maybe I've missed a trick or two. But I noticed the lack of election posters or attempts to really engage people. And for me, that's a recent-ish phenomenon. I'm sure it's been creeping up on us over a period of years. But I think we do live, if we live in a society where people are reluctant to say what they think, and especially the elected leaders of that society aren't even prepared to argue what they think, then we live in a different society to the one that most of us imagine that we're living in. We're living in a very cellular society where we don't even know our neighbours or what they think or what, who they're going to vote for. And that is the challenge I really want to, in the few minutes I've got left, discuss with you. Now, we've, we've got a British government currently who's introducing the seventh piece of counter-terrorism, or has introduced the seventh piece of counter-terrorism legislation since 9-11, almost every other year. And it doesn't matter if it's a Labour government or a Conservative, Liberal Democrat government, they've all gone down the same route. And the latest legislation uh, focuses on uh, demanding that universities and other public institutions, including colleges, prisons, health authorities, and schools, 
quote, identify those vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism. And that itself tells you a lot about how the government thinks that this works, or thinks that this works. It's uh, such a great phrase, identify those vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism, that they don't just say it twice, they say it four times uh, in their um, new act. And yet, it strikes me that the young girls from Tower Hamlets who went off to Syria are far from being young, vulnerable teenagers. They're rather smart and willful and prepared to act. So immediately the very opposite of the model that the government is presenting us with. And I suspect that some smart minds in the Home Office and elsewhere amongst the British government's agencies must know that this new act is not going to solve their problems, this prevent duty that's being imposed on all manner of public institutions. They must know that it's not going to work. But they're doing it to be seen to be doing something. And again, we also live in a society where increasingly public officials don't do what they believe in. They do things to be seen to be doing what's perceived to be the necessary response. And worse, universities who've all discussed this and said this is unworkable, we, you know, we're not going to identify terrorists before they become terrorists. That would be like asking us to identify rapists before they become rapists or criminals before they become criminals. And it's not the job of a university to do apart from anything else. But they, of course, know who pays them. And so they will be introducing new measures to be seen to be complying with the new government legislation. So what does that mean? We live in an age where the government acts to be seen to be acting and its public institutions respond to be seen to be complying. I call that an age of bad faith. And do you know what? Young people in British society today are looking for something to believe in. And everywhere they look, whether it's the government, the local authorities, or anybody else, they see people acting in bad faith, and they're not interested. Now, I'll finish on a little vignette. I had a friend of mine went back to her alma mater, her university where she studied law, and... Um, the old, slightly jaded law professor said, well, you know, um, we can't force them to memorize case law anymore. It's all at their fingertips on their laptop thingies or whatever they call them. And, uh, you know, we don't force them to write long essays. They keep blogs. It's all changed a bit. I can't really, you know, stop them from doing whatever. And she noticed at the back of the class that lots of students were kind of idly surfing the net and texting one another. And then in the evening, she went to the Islamic Society meeting of the same university. And she noticed that there were a lot of the same students who were studying law and going to the Islamic Society class. And at the beginning of the class, the young cleric running the class was confiscating mobile phones. And he was expecting the same students to memorize the Quran back to front and inside out. Not case law, but the Quran. Expect very different expectation. And she then turns around to me and says, Bill, you know, who's radicalizing these people? Is it the cleric feeding hungry young minds who want to believe in something, want to have some structure, rules, meaning, a vision for their lives? Or is it the jaded Western academic who's given up, you know, well, I can't you know, discipline them, I'll be in trouble, I'll get bad student survey rep responses. It's just not worth it. And so what I want to suggest in conclusion is that what we're looking at isn't a foreign ideology, isn't the problems of British foreign policy, isn't the problems of a disenfranchised uh, group in society who have a grievance, but rather we're looking at mainstream moral and intellectual capitulation. Those who ought to know better are unable, no longer believe in anything and are no longer prepared to fight for what they believe in. Once you've got a society like that, you get very odd phenomena. We happen to call it terrorism because it manifests itself in the form that maybe violent extremism would have done in the past. But you need to understand, and this is my very final comment, that the driver is totally different to any form of terrorism we've ever seen before. It reminds me, at the height of the Mumbai attacks, there was a chap called Fahadullah, who was one of the perpetrators, who, whilst killing people, took a mobile phone from somebody he'd just killed and amazingly conducted a live on-air interview with Indian television. And at two points in the interview, the anchors both say to him, what are your demands? And they heard him in the background putting the phone down and turning to someone, evidently, and saying, what are our demands? So if you want a vignette into what it is that we're dealing with, I think that's the best vignette you've got, combined with an elite who have no vision, no direction, are unable to instill any sense of values and purpose
not into young Asians, but into anybody. White kids who say, I want to buy you kick because they'll kick all the foreigners out. And you can't, oh, I don't know what to do about that. Anyway, that's my seven minutes up, I'm sure. So I'll shut up. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, inviting me uh, here tonight. Um, as Paul said in his introduction, I'm a professor of comparative constitutional law. Uh, my areas of interest lie really in freedom of expression and the boundaries that uh, <coughs> liberal democratic states attempt to draw between uh, problematic or unlawful speech and permitted speech. So I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that uh, Bill mentioned in his uh, opening uh, comments. I'm specifically referring to the 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act and the issues that it poses for schools, but particularly universities, um, the, in relation to the government's attempt to prevent radicalization of uh, young students. Uh, we have now uh, an Act of Parliament that's just gone through in March 2015 that places a legal duty. This is a, a new phase in the government's um, anti-radicalization program, a legal duty on listed authorities such as universities, schools, prisons, to have due regard, is the phrase, to have due regard to the need to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. That is the new legal duty that in my university, the Vice-Chancellor of Leeds uh, is now under. And importantly, uh, he has been given guidance by the Home Secretary, who she, she is preparing, she has prepared drafts of what this legislation means on the ground. And the draft guidance has recently been before the House of Lords. It's not quite got through its uh, final stages. And we expect after the general election that there will be new final guidance that will get the approval of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And this will flesh out the nature of universities and schools and prisons duties, uh, the duty to have due regard to the need to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. And if my Vice-Chancellor fails in his duty under this Act, he can expect to be given guidance by the Home Secretary, followed by a direction, followed by an order from the court, which if he disobeys that order or fails to enact it, puts him in contempt of court, which means he could be sent to prison. So this is the new status of the obligations that are being put on uh, universities. Now, there is some protection for freedom of speech in this legislation. There is a reference to it in Section 31 that particular regard must be had to freedom of speech and academic freedom. But the, the whole thrust of the programme is to, in a way, monitor very closely what is being said on campus, and in particular, the threat posed by visiting speakers. And I think the government has in mind Islamic, visiting speakers to Islamic societies and what they may be saying in front of uh, the students. In an earlier version of the uh, guidance, the Home Secretary was expecting that universities would carry out stringent checks on visiting speakers and that student unions would give university authorities 14 days notice to allow for background checks and cancellation of speaking events if necessary. The latest version of the guidance, just before this general election, has omitted that statement, interestingly, and the general understanding is that this, verse, this particular obligation did not meet with the approval of Vince Cable and other liberal members of, of the coalition. But um, we're stuck now with uh, the 2015 Act, and I want to say something about why I think it is uh, problematic. It's problematic because it draws on some very loose and vague notions indeed. The PREVENT strategy has been expanded since 2011 to deal with all forms of terrorism and non-violent extremism. The latter is thought to be responsible for the creation of an atmosphere conducive to terrorism and the popularisation of views which terrorists then exploit. So what is extremism as defined in PREVENT? Well, extremism as defined, is defined as vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, 
mutual respect and the tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. And Theresa May has spelt out in even more detail what she means in relation to that definition. She says the starting point of the new strategy is the emphatic rejection of the misconception that in a liberal democracy like Britain, anything goes. The belief that living in a society like ours means that there aren't any really fundamental rules or norms. Instead, the foundation of our new strategy is the proud promotion of British values. Now, universities are going to be expected to train staff who can carry out a risk assessment to ascertain how their students and which of their students might be at risk of being drawn into terrorism. We're supposed to be on the outlook, or on the lookout rather, for changes in behaviour. Uh, and perhaps we need to look at some of the essays and the comments that students are making in seminars to see if they're being uh, dragged into a more radical uh, circle. Why are these developments controversial? Why ought they to raise uh, concerns for us? Well, the very first point concerns the vagueness of the terminology. Even the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester is on record as saying the phrasing leaves, quote, too much discretion in the hands of the police to decide in the heat of the moment what counts as extremism. And then again, there is the question of what do we mean by British values? Does a visiting speaker talking about Plato's views on the desirability of rule by an elite set of guardians and his arguments against Athenian democracy mean that he is not a speaker, uh, he is not going to be talking about British values? What about a speaker who is known for their favourable assessment of Churchill's career? Does the fact that Churchill advocated the use of poisonous gas against the Kurds and, and also against other uncivilised tribes make Churchill un-British and therefore praise of Churchill, praise of extremism? If we allow the government to close down freedom of expression on campus, do we not also give the enemies of democracy and free speech a tremendous propaganda gift? Because what they will say is, you see, there's British freedom of speech for you. It exists insofar as you're saying things that the establishment are happy for your audience to hear. The moment you deviate from that, they will close you down. And I have to say, as a, as a constitutional lawyer who studied freedom of speech, there are a range already of wide, widely defined laws that impinge already on speakers coming onto campus or out there in the public sphere, incitement to racial hatred public order laws and broadly defined terrorism laws already constrain what may be said. The other point to make, I think, is one breaking up on something that Bill had mentioned, and I'll perhaps conclude round about this area, is that um, the legislation and the new duty seems to expect that university tutors and university staff will be co-opted as surveillance agents for the state. What does that do in terms of the relationship of trust between staff and students? And how is a student who wants to challenge British foreign policy or British military adventurism in the Middle East, how are they going to feel able to express their views without having those views reported higher up and to uh, security service authorities? We're in a difficult area, and I think this needs to be recognised. The final thought I'll leave you with is this. Back in 1947, the US government started an employee loyalty program. Under J. Edgar Hoover, they looked at the uh, contacts of 40,000 employees in, the, in uh, the government services. There were 8,000 investigations that led to formal charges being brought before loyalty boards. One of the questions that federal employees who came under the suspicion of the Hoover program was this. Have you watched foreign films? Have you listened to the records of Paul Robeson? And do you know people who've expressed an ideology that differs to American philosophy? And if you gave the wrong answer to any of those questions, you would find that your employment in the federal service was cast in severe difficulties. And on the back of Hoover's activities, we have, of course, the House of Un-American Activities Committee that saw itself as attempting to uh, remove communistic influences from American society. Those, perhaps, are the relevant parallels from history that we need to be aware of when we look at this programme. Thank you. OK. Um, thanks. Paul and the team for inviting me along today as well. Um, so 
I want to kind of argue that this idea of radicalization has become the main way by which we understand the causes of terrorism and there's a large expert community that has kind of developed around it. Um, many, of, many of these experts themselves, however, point to problems in ways by which the, the theory has been developed and um, applied. Uh, and there are many possible criticisms of radicalization, but I want to concentrate in this seven minutes on issues around the evidence base. Um, so I want to argue that it's a very contested concept. It's politicized, by which I mean it involves um, not just um, data, but, but values as well. Um, and that the data, in fact, that underpins radicalization theory also has many problems. So first of all, radicalization is a very contested concept. There's a lack of agreement as to the definition of it, um, both in policy across different countries as well as within um, the research field. Uh, so some definitions, for example, will focus on extreme beliefs, while others focus more um, specifically on violence. Um, and this has kind of left the field open to, to criticism that there's a real lack of agreement on basic key terms of the field and that in practice this means that it's difficult to differentiate between someone who's radicalised and someone who isn't. Um, and in terms of radicali how radicalisation actually happens then, policy statements in the UK tend to take quite a clear line in terms of the role of ideology. Um, and Ca David Cameron, for example, has talked about this idea of a conveyor belt from extreme beliefs to uh, violent behaviour. But the research field, I would argue, is actually very fragmented and doesn't focus exclusively on ideology at all. But there's a range of, of explanations put forward uh, relating to a whole host of, of issues like um, identity crisis, criminality, discrimination, experience of war and repression and so on. So research points to a much more complex picture and individual nature of radical radicalisation rather than any kind of universal or linear model. Um, and one research review, for example, that was um, released recently concluded that the only standard trait of people that are radicalised is that they tend to be men in their 20s. So this kind of complexity of the research field, I think, isn't um, usually reflected in the kind of policy statements that we often hear. The second point that I want to talk about in, in relation to the evidence base of radicalisation is that it's a very politicised concept. Um, it's a concept that started in policy rather than in academia and, and subsequently the research field has been um, criticised for focusing on policy concerns around contemporary Islamic radicalisation in the West rather than the causes of terrorism more widely. Um, and many of the, many of the radicalisation experts that I've spoken to as, as part of my research um, point to a lack of objectivity in the field and um, the, the fact that experts become very much part of the political discussions, uh, taking different issues, taking sorry different perspectives in, in key issues in the field, um, like whether extremist beliefs are, are part of the problem and, and so on. Um, and clearly questions around terrorism are always going to be controversial but I think that the implication of this is that our understandings of what radicalisation is are very much informed by, um, by these values and, and politics and um, interests as well as, as well as the data. But in terms of this data, I think this is the, the third issue that I want to talk about is um, problems in the, the data behind the theory of radicalisation. So there's a lack of research into many of the explanations that have been proposed. Most work in the field is, is conceptual. Um, and just to give an example, a, a, lit review that, a literature review that was published recently found uh, 4,160 relevant documents on radicalisation, but only 17 of those actually contain primary evidence. And in the evidence that does exist, there's a lot of discussion around the uh, methodological problems that it has. So just to give um, one example, a lot of the models of radicalisation are based on very small samples and they don't usually consider um, people with similar backgrounds that have not become violently radicalised. Um, so this means that there's a lack of understanding of why, why this particular minority of people become violent when the vast majority of people don't. Um, and I think the problem that comes from this is that when, when theories of radicalisation kind of take on a, 
uh, air of certainty or, or a scientific nature when actually they're very tentative and untested and unproven. A final related problem that in the evidence base that I want to talk about is more about our understanding of the effectiveness of counter radicalization policies. <coughs> and so there's been a lack of evaluation of outcomes of counter radicalization policies, and most evaluations tend to concentrate instead on, on outputs. Um, and there are a number of kind of inherent problems in evaluation in this field. So just to mention um, a couple, I mean the different definitions of radicalization that I talked about earlier lead to different ideas of what an effective policy would look like and so where, where evaluation should focus its efforts. And this in turn makes it difficult to kind of compare the, the results of different evaluations. Um, and in addition, the, the kind of ultimate desired outcome of counter-radicalization policies is, is nothing, if you will, as in no terrorism. So there's a real difficulty in kind of linking that no terrorism back to a particular policy. Um, so as well as difficulties in the evidence base around radicalization then, I think there's, there's kind of similar issues facing the evaluation of the, the evidence base of counter-radicalization. Okay, so just to kind of draw this to a close then, I mean, none of this is news to people who work in the field of radicalization. So as, long, as well as having a very critical audience, the field has focused itself and examined its own weaknesses quite a lot. And I've just kind of tried to draw this together um, to talk about today. But I do think that radicalization has taken on a huge power in, in policy and in public debate, um, as well as in academia and research. Um, but I think there are these, these quite fundamental issues around evidence that kind of raise problems as to the status of the theory and also the, the foundations of expertise um, in the field um, that has developed around it. Okay, thanks.